Welcome to the second Roderick Hall Memorial Lectures, Camelon's Rebellion, 1948 to 1955, a forgotten Sulu insurgency and the hidden legacies of World War II. My name is Charlene Diaz, and I'm the head of programs for Filipinas Heritage Library. Camelon's Rebellion, 1948 to 1955, continues the story that Tom McKenna shared in last year's talk, The Unsung Heroes of Mindanao. It's another narrative filled with gripping action, resourcefulness and ingenuity, political betrayal and piracy, all the ingredients needed for a Hollywood movie. But before we embark on that journey, I would like to thank Ms. Consuelo Paul McHugh and family for their generous support in making this lecture series possible. Each talk in the series promotes a uniquely Filipino experience of World War II and how the legacy of the war continues to be felt in present times. Equally importantly, each talk activates an element of the Roderick Hall Collection of Filipinas Heritage Library, a collection that Mr. Hall built over the course of his lifetime. Now, let's hear from some of Roderick Hall's closest collaborators as they pay tribute to a dear friend. Rod described himself as a man with a mission and a man in a hurry. His mission was to collect as many materials on the experiences of Filipinos during World War II and to place them in a library that would ensure that these are shared with today's generation as well as those in the future. And he found this repository as well as partners with us in the Filipinas Heritage Library. So in 2010, Broad shipped his entire collection, lock, stock, and barrel, of 700 volumes from his home in London to FHL in Makati. Through the years, his collection has grown to more than 2,000 print and non-print materials on World War II making the Roderick Hall Collection FHL's crown jewel. As such, it is FHL's centerpiece, literally and figuratively, because we now revolve our collection focus around the period immediately before, during, and right after World War II, identified as the formative period of Philippine nation. to collect books and various other historical materials relating to the Philippines during that war and to make this more accessible to the general public. He turned this collection over to the Filipinas Heritage Library where it now forms a major part of its holdings as the Roderick Hall Collection. But Rod was not one to simply donate books. He wanted other people to use them and to research more on the war. He wanted to add more materials and was constantly in search of new directions for the collection. To this end, he was able to negotiate digitization of numerous manuscripts in various collections around the Philippines. He wanted to provide as many different perspectives as possible. And when he learned of the large body of works in Japanese, aimed to acquire as much as possible for the collection. Why are you collecting? Japanese publications about the Battle of Philippines, even though you do not understand Japanese language. You said to me, I always answer this question like that. I want next future generation to know what happened in Philippines during the Asia Pacific War and the Philippines under Japanese rule. However, you told me the real reason is that collecting Japanese books is to make peace of my mind and making requiem for my deceased family. As a post-war Japanese generation, I promise you 
to try to make no more war society and also to try not to create the kind of people such as you and your family horribly experienced in Philippines. I think the Japanese should know the facts of this history. I believe this is my mission as a Japanese. Current thinking on the previous century, its many upheavals and wars, is that we all have an ethical obligation to remember that history. But understandably, not everyone takes up that burden because the memory of war, especially for persons who witnessed it, is painful. The late Mr. Rod Hall was deeply courageous in that sense of taking up an ethical burden. He took pains to give World War II its proper mourning, not just for himself, but also for our country, America and Japan, whose materials he collected. He helped strengthen our cultural memory in the hope of preventing the return of suffering. And now with his passing, we in turn at Filipinos Heritage Library and the Ayala Foundation have an obligation to make his legacy and his commemoration of history endure. Now let me introduce our speaker. Thomas McKenna is an anthropologist who has lived and worked for years in Bangsamoro communities in the Philippines and has spent decades writing and conducting research on their culture and history. Formerly Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, he has won writing and teaching awards and has been invited to present his work on the Moros at Oxford University, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, among other forums. He is the author of Moro Warrior from Ateneo University Press, Muslim Rulers and Rebels from Anvil Press. His forthcoming book, Man of Mindanao, about the life of Sultan Mohammed H. Adil, is a sequel to Moro Warrior. It should be published in the Philippines in early 2025. He lives with his wife in San Francisco. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Thomas McKenna. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Good morning, Farlene, and good morning to everyone. We're so thrilled that you could join FHL again for this return engagement. Um, Last year's Unsung Heroes of Mindanao really was a remarkable exploration of an overlooked aspect of Philippine World War II history. Um, and it was a big hit with our audience. So what do you have in store for us this year? Well, I have a, a combination of the old and the new, and thank you very much for that generous introduction. Uh, it is a continuation of the last presentation because it starts in 1946, right after the war. And it also features one of the key characters from last year's presentation, uh, Lieutenant Muhammad Adil. But it also has uh, some very new elements, a new location, Sulu, rather than Mindanao, and a new and fascinating main character, the title character, Kamlun. Right. It's a very, um, I won't delay the lecture anymore. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, I turn the floor over to Thomas McGonagall. Thank you very much. And, and again, good morning to everyone. 
let me start in 1946. Uh, with the end of the Second World War and the inauguration of the Third Republic, the Philippines became the first Asian country to break free of formal Western colonialism. But breaks with the past are rarely clean ones, and a great deal has been written about the tangled and inequitable relationship between the new Philippine Republic and its former colonizer, the United States, especially in the first decade after the end of the war. One well-known example of that entanglement is the Huk Palahap or Huk Rebellion in central Luzon. There, a communist-inspired peasant fight fighting force of former World War II guerrillas held territory less than a day's march from Manila and strongly challenged the new republic. Now, the Cold War was just getting underway and the Huck Rebellion quickly gained American attention. In 1950, afraid of losing the Philippines as they had just lost China in their words, American State Department officials hurried to help crush the rebellion, choosing as their agent, Edward Lansdale there on the right, an expert in covert operations. Now, although he's often identified as a CIA agent, Lansdale actually worked for an even more shadowy organization, the Office of Policy Coordination, which was conducting the covert operations that the newly organized CIA was not yet allowed to do. Within four years, Lansdale and his public partner in the Philippine government, Defense Secretary Ramon Magsaysay, had suppressed the Huck Rebellion through a combination of new military funding, psychological warfare, and programs for landless peasants. My focus today, however, is on another lesser known insurgency, Kamloon's Rebellion. It was fought at roughly the same time, but on the opposite end of the Philippine archipelago. Kamloon was a Taosud farmer from the island of Holo in the Sulu archipelago. Contemporary news reports usually refer to him as Daku Kamloon or Haji Kamloon. The Taosud simply addressed him as Maas or Elder. For brevity, I'll, I'll simply call him Kamloon. By 1950, he was already in his 60s. He had fought the Japanese army as a wartime guerrilla, and now he had united a number of separate armed bands to fight the Philippine Republic. Philippine Republic. His rebel force was only a fraction of the size of the Huck army, never numbering more than three or 400 fighters. But by 1948, he controlled more than a quarter of Holo Island. And as we'll see, for its size, his rebellion proved quite costly for the new government. Now, the origins of Kamloon's rebellion are complex, but some clear patterns stand out. First is anti-Japanese resistance on Holo and throughout Sulu during the war. Sulu was a Japanese stronghold during the war. More than 6,000 Japanese troops occupied the island of Holo. Wartime encounters with Taosud guerrillas on Holo and Tawi Tawi were intense and brutal, and as many as 3,000 Japanese soldiers may have died at the hands of those guerrillas in the last year of the war. That is a picture of Taosud guerrillas on Holo uh, greeting uh, the American uh, uh, invasion forces when they arrived. Well, the war also brought a flood of American guns in a development filled with irony, the American military, which had insisted throughout the entire colonial period that Moros as well as most Filipinos be denied access to guns left the islands awash in firearms and ammunition when they returned quickly home at the end of the Pacific War in late 1945. Now, one of the very last American campaigns of the entire Pacific War was fought in Mindanao and Sulu in the summer of 1945. So a disproportionate number of American weapons were simply abandoned in the Southern Philippines. Uh, then uh, there is the legacy of antagonism between Moros and Christian Filipinos. In a manner similar to Indonesians or Malaysians, some Moros in early 1946 objected to the return to power of their old colonizers after the defeat of the Japanese occupiers. A twist in Mindanao and Sulu, however, was that their American colonizers had themselves left after the, defeating the Japanese but were then replaced by Christian Filipinos. Despite their own history of major atrocities against the Moros, American colonizers had been seen by Moros as a buffer against political domination by their old enemies, the Filipinos from the North. That enmity was not just a dim memory. Just 50 years earlier, at the end of the 19th century, at the very end of the 19th century, thousands of Filipino soldiers under Spanish commanders had attacked Moro communities in Mindanao 
burning fields and homes as they went. So there were still people alive in 1945 who remembered uh, those incursions at the end of the last century. Speaking of legacies, let me talk for just a minute about the history of the term Moro, a term that I use here in this presentation and that I've also, also used in the title of my last book, Moro Warrior. The Spaniards first gave that name to the Muslim peoples of the Southern Philippines when try, while trying unsuccessfully to conquer them. It was the same name that they had given to their more familiar Muslim enemies from Mauritania and Morocco. The term Moro eventually became an epithet among Christian Filipinos. To them, it meant savage or pirate. And it was also, of course, long considered an insult by Philippine Muslims to be called a Moro. But in a bold symbolic shift, Philippine Muslim separatists during the late 1960s transformed the term Moro into a positive symbol of collective identity. And they formalized the term by adding the prefix bangsa, which means people or nation. In this presentation, I use a shorter term, uh, a form Moro, instead of the more formal form bangsa Moro uh, to refer to indigenous Philippine Muslims. So back to Kamloon, Kamloon's misgivings about continued rule by outsiders after the defeat of the Japanese caused him to take up our arms again against a new, uh, a, 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 what he considered to be a new uh, uh, interloper. From 1948 to 1951, Kamloon's rebellion made few waves in the national consciousness. Polo, as you see there, was very far from Manila, but that state of affairs changed quickly in 1951. In late 51, the Philippine military sent its most elite counterinsurgency team, the Nanita unit, to solve the Kamloon problem once and for all. This was the same unit that had terrorized Huck fighters and civilians in central Luzon and had recently been deployed in Korea. This picture here is a picture of the Nanita unit on patrol in Korea. Well, on a foot patrol deep into the Suaswa forest on Holo, the unit was ambushed by Kamloon's fighters. When the last blade fell, the much-feared Nanita unit had been annihilated, with only a few soldiers escaping to tell the tale. Kamloon had finally gained the full attention of Defense Secretary Mike Saisai, Saisai and his American advisor, Edward Lansdale, seen there on the left. Mike Saisai ordered an all-out assault on Kamloon's refuge and committed two infantry battalions and two Sherman tanks to the task. But Magsaysay and Lansdale were so eager for a quick end to the rebellion in the South, they were still dealing with the Hucks in the North, that they also secretly offered Kamloon incentives to surrender, and the rebel leader soon agreed to them. In August 1952, he met Magsaysay on a beach in northeastern Holo and turned in a few dozen rusty rifles, and you can see them uh, there in picture on the left. But the formal surrender turned out to be little more than a photo op. When Kamloon's promised concessions, which included a 20,000 peso payment to him, as well as funding for a pilgrimage to Mecca for himself and uh, some of his followers, when that had not been delivered in two weeks, he quickly restarted his revolt. In response, Magsaysay redoubled his efforts. He sent artillery, fighter planes, Navy ships and Philippine Marines to reinforce the troops already in Holo. He had Edward Lansdale approve the use of American napalm against the rebels, the same American napalm <laughs> later used in Vietnam. And uh, Lansdale, some of you may know, was also a key architect of that uh, disastrous uh, war in Vietnam. But despite the overwhelming force now arrayed against Kamloon, the conflict quickly stalemated. The military killed or captured scores of rebels, but at least as many government soldiers as rebels were killed or wounded in each encounter. In addition, five of the 30 fighter planes used in the campaign were downed by small arms fire from Kamloon's fighters. Well, Magsaysay quietly initiated negoci negotiations once again, and two months later, Kamloon surrendered for a second time. This time, there would be no ceremony on the beach. There would be a trial on a Navy ship anchored in Holo Harbor. In that trial, Kamloon and 22 of his top lieutenants 
who had been called common outlaws and bandits in every single government report and news article, newspaper article written about them, were convicted of the most political of crimes, rebellion, and they were sentenced to life terms in prison. However, concessions had once again secretly been made. Instead of being transported to Multinupa in November of 1952, Kamlun and his men were granted conditional pardons by President Carino and exiled to nearby Tawi Tawi, the second largest island in the Sulu archipelago. I haven't discovered what Kamlun did um, while uh, in exile. And in fact, uh, there are indications, uh, I'm sorry, and, and it's not even certain that he actually went to Tawi Tawi, but there are indications that he spent at least part of his time strengthening his alliances throughout the Sulu archipelago, and especially with the pirate networks of the Southern Polo Coast. After a year and a half in exile, Kamlun quietly escaped to return to Eastern Holo and launch his final armed revolt. The third government campaign against Kamloon was the largest of all. And the, with the participation of all five military branches, what was now called the Holo Task Force included Philippine Navy patrol boats and 5,000 troops in all. Nevertheless, the conflict soon stalemated again and this time remained stalemated for more than a year and a half. Within just a few months of the revived rebellion, the casualty rate among junior military officers in Holo was the highest in the country, and many of them were doing whatever they could to be transferred off the island. Well, there was one young junior officer who was very pleased to be transferred to the island in early 1954. Lieutenant Mohammed Adio was a Moro, a member of the Maguindanao nobility, and an officer in the Philippine Constabulary, which is the fifth, was the fifth branch of the Philippine military. Lieutenant Adio had been a teenage guerrilla officer in World War II. Now he was called to hold up with other Moro PC officers to join the hunt for Kamlo, and he relished the opportunity. Much of the information in this presentation and in my forthcoming book is based on the oral history of his life that Muhammad Adil generously shared with me over more than 10 years. Many of the pictures you are seeing, including this one, uh, are also from his collection, and I am grateful to his family for letting me share them with you today. For the first months after his arrival in Holo, Lieutenant Adil's platoon was always at the forefront of the hunt for Kamlon. But despite his best efforts, he could never make contact with the enemy even though he could sometimes hear them nearby in the jungle. He eventually realized that Kamlun's fighters were avoiding his unit because they did not want to attack fellow Moros. His soldiers, all Maguindanaoans, refused to wear the helmets issued them, wearing their traditional two bows instead. Even Adil wore his helmet only in camp, like seen here, uh, not in the field. Those colorful two bows marked them as Moros, even in the dense jungle. Although Kamlun's rebellion is mostly forgotten now, in 1955, it made the news and even garnered international attention. Here is a cover article about Kamlun from the June 1955 issue of Harper's, Harper's Magazine, a popular uh, American periodical. The title, which you see there in red on the bottom, is uh, the, the Landlocked Pirate of the Pacific. It's a catchy title, but it, but quite inaccurate. Kamlun was neither a pirate, uh, nor was he landlocked. It's quite hard to be landlocked on a small island. But the focus on piracy was not far off the mark because international piracy centered in Holo had recently started up again after a very long hiatus. That resurgence was made possible by surplus American military equipment left in the Southern Philippines particularly powerful diesel engines that could be attached to light boats to create very fast motor launches. Thanks to the automatic weapons and diesel engines left behind by the U.S. military, Sulu pirates could now raid farther, travel faster, and carry more firepower than ever before. Just a historical reminder here, 
that sea raiding is an ancient practice in the Philippines. And in fact, it used to be practiced all over the Philippines reciprocally by raiders based throughout the archipelago. So prior to Spanish colonialism, there were Tagalog pirates and Bisayan pirates, as well as Hulu pirates, and they all raided one another. But Spanish colonizers disarmed the territories that they controlled without providing adequate protection against raids from the sea. So Sulu pirates became the Vikings of island Southeast Asia, making seasonal raids against poorly defended coastal communities and carrying away people and plunder. Those raids didn't end until the introduction of steam powered gunboats by, gun by the Spaniards in the 1840s. Now the first major pirate raid since the start of the Japanese war was launched from Holo in late March of 1954 to attack the town of Simporna in British North Borneo, now Saba. It took place just as Kamloon escaped exile and resumed his rebellion. And it is very unlikely that the timing was coincidental. According to Muhammad Adil, who was a former intelligence officer, some of Kamloon's many lieutenants had moved into international piracy to support his new rebellion. On March 29, 1954, more than 50 holo-based pirates and two black launches attacked Semporna at dusk. Lobbing grenades and firing automatic weapons, they overwhelmed the local police force and killed two constables and a British officer. One of the constables who was killed in that, in that skirmish is a, the tall soldier right there closest to us wearing the turban, Sergeant Singh. Sergeant Singh was a valiant, uh, fought valiantly, but was uh, killed by the pirates while defending the town. And uh, his death was mourned for a, a very long time afterwards. There were, there were newspaper articles about his death, death uh, 20 years after this incident. The pirates um, then emptied the town's bank and armory and looted stores before speeding off into the night with their, in, with their boats filled with gold, cash, guns, and cigarettes. More raids followed against towns bordering the Celebi Sea in Sulawesi, in Kalimantan in the south, and in Mindanao, and they garnered more international attention. Well, the Philippine government was now faced with growing diplomatic pressure and deteriorating international press, and they were forced to act. The government dedicated even more military resources to Holo, creating a separate naval task force focused on fighting piracy. That force included the Navy's first aircraft carrier, which you see here. It was a repurposed American LST that could carry a patrol helicopter to spot pirate boats at sea. Well, helicopters coupled with on-ground intelligence helped greatly in finding pirate boats, but what was still needed was a small, highly mobile unit able to stop and search suspected pirates' boats returning to Holo. Lieutenant Adil and his hand-picked soldiers filled that role. When they received intelligence that a pirate boat with a crew of 29 had recently left Holo from Maimbung Bay to raid across the border, he took 20 of his best men in two boats and went to sea to try to intercept them. After six days in open boats on the Celebi Sea with no pirates spotted and all of his men desperately seasick, he ended the mission. Two days later, however, he received new intelligence that the pirate boat had been spotted re-entering the Sulu archipelago. He quickly rounded up what troopers he could, this time choosing them for seaworthiness um, rather than fighting ability. He could find only eight of them, eight local troopers, all of whom had reached the mandatory retirement age, but they were all men of the sea. Back out on the sea they went, nine men in a small wooden boat hunting for 29 pirates. And finally they found them. When Lieutenant Adil hailed the suspect boat and demanded to search it, the pirates responded with a furious burst of automatic gunfire, hitting one of Adil's men, a 60 year old private, in the forehead. But the constabulary boat had a 50 caliber machine gun, and when Adil was able to maneuver it, he gained a firepower advantage. 
After a firefight that lasted more than an hour, the pirate ship, uh, the pirate boat finally ran itself aground on a tiny island in Maimbung Bay. It was the first successful interdiction of a pirate boat in the post-war period, and Lieutenant Adil became an overnight national hero. The Secretary of National Defense himself flew, flew Adil to Manila on his own plane for press interviews. Major newspapers ran stories crediting him with breaking the backbone of piracy in Sulu. He received the Military Merit Medal for Gallantry in Action, which you see here, and he earned an eventual promotion to captain. Back in Holo, after his heady time in Manila, Adil pursued Kamloon's lieutenants even more energetically. In one six-week per six period in April and May of 1955, he was responsible for killing or capturing six of those lieutenants. In response, Kamloon's followers targeted Adil, ambushing, ambushing him in his jeep, in his boat, at his camp, and even in his home. He sent his wife and daughters back to Cotabato for safety. See here on this uh, slide, these are some of the individ individual rebels and pirates who were captured uh, by Lieutenant Adil. Uh, the, um, uh, the folks on the left uh, seated are, uh, had, had, uh, um, had been on a pirate raid uh, to uh, Indonesia, and you'll notice that there's a woman among them. So not all pirates were uh, male. Well, Kamloon's lieutenants were falling one by one, but Kamloon himself remained secure and free in Eastern Holo. He was moving constantly, never staying more than one night in a village, and he still had more than 100 armed men with him. But finally, a full 18 months after he'd escaped exile and restarted his rebellion, the military task force managed to surround Kamloon. The rebel chieftain and his remaining fighters had gathered at Kota Sihe on the southernmost, a ruined fort on a rocky knoll, just 300 yards from the sea on the southernmost tip of Eastern Holo. They were surrounded on three sides by more than 1,500 soldiers and just off the beach, naval gunboats patrolled the bay to prevent their escape. Captain Adil, now Captain Adil, who now commanded a PC company, was back on the front lines of the siege with his men. To tighten the noose, the general directing the siege ordered his soldiers to construct sagili, 12-foot lanes of bamboo fence that they then moved at night to draw the circle tighter around the rocky knoll. The next afternoon, he ordered a one-hour artillery barrage that pulverized the hill. When the smoke cleared, an armored car climbed the knoll but found only one shattered body. The soldiers surrounding the knoll spent a sleepless night awaiting Kamlun's attack. But when dawn broke, they discovered that he and his men had slipped through their lines by crawling under armored cars, silently killing a dozen soldiers and two officers as they went. Kamlun's last stand had become Kamlun's last breakout. But Kamlun, who, who had shrapnel in his arm from the shelling of Kota Sihe, Sihe, was tired. And he surrendered one month later for the third and final time. Once again, he did so after negotiations initiated by the Philippine government. Once again, there were secret inducements, including cash payments for his surrender, despite the government's claim that it was entirely conditional. But this time he was tried and convicted in a civilian court, sentenced to life in prison and sent to Muntinlupa. Well, to gauge Kamlun's career, I think it's useful to compare him with Geronimo, one of the last and most famous of all Native American resistance leaders. Geronimo, and Geronimo is an extraordinarily famous um, individual, um, in the, in the United States, when I when I went to college, which was a few years ago, um, almost every uh, uh, almost every college dorm room had a poster of uh, Geronimo. Geronimo was a a, a Chiricahua Apache leader in southern Arizona. 
he also fought a powerful government for 10 years without ever being defeated. He also voluntarily surrendered three times, the last time in 1886. And he was also finally sent to prison away from home, far from home, all the way to Florida. Geronimo eluded capture for nearly a decade in the vast expanse of the Sierra Madre Mountains on the U.S.-Mexico border. Kamloon did the same thing, but on a small island. Geronimo's famous Kamloon has been mostly forgotten, unfortunately. Both men, however, at heart, were simply trying to live unmolested in their ancestral homelands. Now, there's a fascinating coda to Kamloon's story that I'd like to share with you. In 1967, a dozen years after receiving his life sentence, Kamloon, now a very old man, as you can see there, came to the attention of a young scholar, political act activist, and UP lecturer, Norma Swari. Miswari, who like Kamloon was a Taosuk from Polo, became determined to free him from prison so that he could die at home on the island of Polo. Miswari was able to get a message directly to Ferdinand Marcos on his birthday, which read in part, Kamloon is dying. This man has already paid for his crime. Within hours, he received a phone call from the presidential palace telling him that Kamloon would be, be released the next day. Kamloon was able to return home to die, and Nur Miswari went on to found the Moro National Liberation Front and become Marcos's principal political nemesis over the next decade. It is striking in retrospect that despite intervening in the fate of Kamloon, Ferdinand Marcos did not learn the lesson of Kamloon that invading the Moro homeland with military force would lead only to an extremely costly quagmire. Well, there's an even more fascinating coda to the story of PC Captain Mohammed Adil. It tells of how later in his life, the military hero of the young Philippine Republic was transformed by martial law and the military invasion of his homeland of Cotabato into a brigadier general in the Moro National Liberation Front. You see him there with Norm Miswari. But that story will have to wait for a future presentation. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Tom. And what a way to end the presentation with a teaser like that, leaving us happy <laughs> for a part three. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we forgive you as long as we're able to take you up on the offer. My pleasure. Um, let's open the floor for questions. Our first question, and I, I apologize if I say the name incorrectly because it's unusual to me. I think it's Gil Jones uh, who asks, what is Kamalan's legacy that enables today's society to prosper? And how did he pull people to join his uprising? Well, that's a good question. Let me um, see if I can talk first about his legacy. Um, so we think, so Kamalan was convicted of the same exact political crime as uh, Luis Tarouk. He was convicted of the, the, the head of the Huck uh, uh, the, the Hucks. Um, he was con convicted of the uh, convicted of the crime of rebellion, but he was a very different a sort of rebel uh, than Luis Tarouk. He was not educated. He was not an ideologue like Tarouk. He he's also different from leaders of the of the later Moro separatist movement, who are also mostly uh, uh, very well educated and also ideologues. Kamu is a man of tradition. Uh, a, a traditional leader, but with one with extraordinary leadership skills. So I think the best way to think about him is as a, a link between the past and the present, um, a link between uh, early anti-colonial resistance uh, in Mindanao and Sulu and the modern movement for Bangsamoro autonomy. So in that sense, I think he's a, a, a unifying and an inspiring figure uh, for Bangsamoro youth today. And uh, when asking about uh, how he uh, gained followers in, in his day, I think it's the same reason. He was an, a unifying and inspiring figure a figure for youth then, and that's how he was able to uh, attract uh, them as followers. Yes, um, I will ask, I'll, I'll follow up about the youth uh, question later, uh, because it is fascinating to me that 
technically Camelon was a senior citizen. So, you know, how do you bridge that gap and inspire uh, young people to join? But let me go now to the second uh, pre-registration question. This is from Michael Eric Borromeo, and he asks, Does the ca did Camelon's rebellion gain support from the Sulu Sultanate and other Muslim polities on mainland Mindanao? Um, I don't. Um, th th thank you for that question. Um, I don't really know the answer uh, to that question yet. Um, in 1950, uh, the a new sultan, uh, Sultan Kiram the first, um, sort of ascended to the the throne, and um, but the Sulu Sultan had, had been in um, um, pretty uh, difficult shape for for years before that, mostly because of a a very um, uh, very complex um, dispute about who should be sultan uh, and who was the real sultan. Uh, but uh, Kiram I was officially recognized by the Phil Philippine government in 1962. And um, that was important recognition that, that they hadn't given before. So I'm, I don't know that um, uh, he that he would have been a strong supporter of Kamloom. I, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that. This was a... Um, Again, this was a time also of you uh, thinking about Mindanao that um, uh, key Philippine uh, politicians, uh, Philippine Muslim politicians like uh, Salipata Pendatun were were really gaining power and uh, influence in Manila. And so again, they um, they were pretty committed to the Philippine Republic uh, for their part at, at the time. Uh, that changed for good reason. Uh, and um, but at the time, uh, they were committed to the Philippine Republic, so I don't think they would have been strong supporters either. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to read a comment uh, from the webinar chat that I, I really caught my attention. It's from, this isn't a question, uh, but it's from Cesar Formentera Jr. who wrote, without Camlon, we have no Mindanao State University. The establishment of MSU is because of Camlon's demand. And that is one of the legacies of Camelon to us, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Yeah. Right? I, I read that and yeah. I thought, wow, that's that's really incredible. So thank you, Cesar, for sharing that um, with the audience. And our last our last pre-reg question, um, I think of it more as an allegorical question. Um, and I hope you're not taken too off guard by it. But it is from Chitana Diacampo who says, what does this teach us about standing our ground in the West Philippine Sea? Well, I um, that the what's going on in the West Philippine Sea is a very a fascinating, very complex topic. Uh, but I am not at all uh, qualified to speak about it. Uh, but I think you know, I will take it as an allegorical uh, allegorical question, and um, I think uh, it's uh, I think we could say. Uh, Pretty safely, the Kamloon's rebellion was a real David and Goliath story. So, in that sense, uh, it uh, it can serve as an inspiration uh, for uh, the da David and Goliath uh, conflict going on in the uh, West uh, uh, Sulu Sea. Thank you, thank you so much for and that, then, uh, Tom. I'm going to jump now to our Q and A box in Zoom, and it is filling up rapidly. So, uh, the first question is from. I apologize if I say this incorrectly. Uh, my Sara Latif, who says, "What are the reasons behind Kamlon's revolt? Is the is his identity based? Is it identity based as a moral or in the name of the Tausug people?" That's uh, that, that's a very good question. I, I um, as I, I mentioned in the in the talk, the the reasons for the revolt are complex and. Um, uh, in, in fact, um, Muhammad Adil, um, in, in his uh, explanation, included such things as the fact that Kamlun was, was quite upset at uh, very local um, government officials uh, for various reasons uh, who were not, uh, uh, who were not uh, uh, Filipinos, uh, Christian Filipinos, who were also a Tao Sug, uh, but who had been appointed by Christian Filipinos. So there were there were uh, you can think of it as sort of nested reasons. There were, he had very specific uh, problems, uh, but he had more general problems with the fact that that um, 
uh, that that uh, he was being uh, molested in various ways uh, in his homeland, uh, including uh, attempts to uh, to uh, try him for things that he had done during uh, during the war that um, uh, were um, had questionable questionable legality. But I think in general uh, he was fighting as a uh, as a a Taosug, a Taosug warrior, a Taosug traditional leader uh, on the island of Holo and. Um, uh, and not uh, not uh, uh, more not so much more generally as a, a moral. Although again, uh, as I said, you know the 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 feelings he was having, uh, the misgivings he was having about um, having been uh, brought into the Philippine Republic were very similar to misgivings um, uh, um, that others were having, uh, other moros were having elsewhere in Mindanao and Sulu. Thank you, Tom. That was a very comprehensive answer to a complex question on identity. Um, Ivy Tan would like to know, was Kamlon a part of the guerrilla unit of Wendell Fertig during World War II? Very specific knowledge there. Oh, a, a very good question. Only in the most uh, general uh, sense. Um, Wendell Fertig um, uh, formally and theoretically was... Um, uh, in control of all the guerrillas in Mindanao and Sulu, right? I uh, I I doubt that that the Kamloon uh, had ever heard that name or knew who Wendell Fertig was. But if you looked at a if you looked at a uh, a list of of um, uh, a, a map of a command structure, uh, Wendell Fertig would have been at the top, yes, of uh, of uh, the formal guerrillas of uh, of of uh, the Sulu archipelago. I think in relation to this question, now is a good time um, to bring in the issue of a younger generation, because we mentioned earlier that Kamalon was in his 60s when the rebellion started. So um, I, I am assuming here that most of the people who joined him were his uh, fellow soldiers from World War II, um, which meant they were also, I guess, more elderly, uh, older soldiers. Um, was Kamlan able to inspire um, younger younger members of of the region to join him in his in his rebellion? Uh, yes, he was. Uh, so he had you know he had um, he had veterans of World War II with him, and again, it wasn't uh, they weren't that old because they um, he was he was an old guerrilla, old World War II guerrilla already, and. Uh, but I would guess that most of his fellow guerrillas were uh, much younger than him, and so they weren't that old. But I think he also was able to attract um, even younger um, uh, uh, men uh, who were uh, who had come of age after the war. Uh, he was, as I said, he was inspiring, um, and and um, uh, you know, and he uh, he was able to to bring people together and uh, inspire young men to join him. Now we should all, it should also be noted that many many of Kamloon's Kamloon's fighters were killed, and so there was a there's really a, there was a generation of um, young men in um, in uh, Eastern Holo who were decimated, and that and that um, that that was noticeable. Uh, many children grew up without fathers uh, in that in that in that part of uh, Holo. So it was a it's you know worthwhile to remember that it was a tragedy as well. Yes, of course. Um, it, it is such a dramatic story that we do tend to focus on um, some of the numbers that you mentioned, like three to four hundred people in the rebellion versus an army of five thousand. Um, right. It's just it's um, it's really, truly a David and Goliath story. Um, but since we brought up the topic of um, the former World War II guerrillas that joined Kamlan's fight, um, this brings up the question of um, Lieutenant Adil, actually, who has also appeared quite a bit in our webinar chat. And people are curious to learn, myself included, um, what it must have been like for Adil, if you could speak for the family, um, because you are quite close to them. Um, what was it like for Lieutenant Adil to be tasked um, and to accept the task of, of of having to capture Kamlon when you mentioned in the presentation that uh, Kamlon himself did not want to engage 
a fellow Moro. Um, so at one point they were they were compatriots against uh, the Japanese in World War II, but now Adil is representing the Philippine government actually, uh, trying to capture Camelon. Could you explain more about that dynamic? I absolutely, and uh, in fact, I can. Um, the reason I can explain it is because um, Muhammad Adil and, and I, and I, um, I usually call him Sultan Adil because his, the last title he held um, in his life was as a, a Sultan of Cotabato. So um, Sultan Adil and I uh, uh, talked quite a bit about that because it was it was such an interesting uh, topic and, and an interesting time for him. Um, uh, Lieutenant Adil, the young Lieutenant Adil, had really admired uh, Kamlun's prowess, and he wanted to learn the secrets of his success. He also wanted to test himself against Kamlun. He wanted to fight Kamlun face to face, and he was very disappointed that he never had that opportunity. Um, well, I forgot to mention, I uh, apologize for this, that the last picture I showed of Kamlun at, at his surrender was taken by uh, Muhammad Adil. It, I, it's my favorite picture of Kamlun because it shows him as it's this combination of both fierce and vulnerable. It's a really wonderful picture. And uh, and uh, Muhammad Adil took that picture when he went to visit Kamlun in jail to ask him about the secrets of his uh, of his prowess and how he was able to uh, fight the military for so long. Um, so that was that was sort of one uh, one side of his thinking. Um, you know that Kamlun was the enemy. He uh, he was a, a highly he was a respected enemy. Uh, uh, but uh, he, he wanted to he wanted to to uh, conquer him, uh, defeat him. Uh, but later in his tour of duty of Sulu, uh, after Kamlun's capture, Adil became closer to local Taoist leaders. Um, after he, he killed or captured enough of uh, Adil's lieutenants, they they began coming to him to surrender, voluntarily surrendering to him. He got to know them, and, um, and he got to know uh, various local leaders. And, and gradually, he was able to see a, the bigger picture of uh, what was going on in Holo. And in retrospect, he called the campaign, uh, the multiple campaigns uh, against uh, um, Kamloon. He referred to them as a sad affair, that it was a sad undertaking. Um, he had mixed feelings about Kamloon. Uh, he, um, he, you know, he, he said, I, I, you know, I, I really admire him and he's a, a marvelous warrior, but he's also a criminal. Uh, because he had, uh, he had, Kamlun did, you know, did commit some crimes. Uh, there were murders that uh, that he pretty clearly committed, and uh, robberies and so forth. And uh, Adil didn't like that side, but he did admire the, um, he did really admire the, uh, the warrior side of him. And he also disliked what he started to see as the crusade overtones of this massive military response to Kamlun's rebellion. He, you know, he, he basically he told me. Here's a man who's just trying to live in his homeland, you know, unmolested in the way he always has. And somehow he has attracted, you know, this huge um, uh, uh, and, and very, um, uh, you know, just a, 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 an over response on the part of uh, the military uh, to get him. And he said, in some senses, it, it felt like a, it felt like a crusade and he did not like that aspect. So um, mixed feelings, uh, but uh, he had a very, very nuanced uh, approach to Kamloon and, and what Kamloon stood for. That's really wonderful to hear because uh, the whole topic today is very um, multi-layered and nuanced. And even I myself am feeling a little bit anxious about it. So that was a wonderful answer to the question. Um, from Gerardo Reynaldo, who has really participated so wonderfully in the chat. Thank you, sir, for that. Um, the question is, can we assume that Kamlon and his followers had help from relatives in nearby Borneo? <laughs> That's a very good question. I don't know. I, um, I don't know uh, of any uh, specific uh, cases of that, uh, but um, those who are familiar with the history of Sulu, the Sulu Sultanate, and also the history of migration, um, know that uh, that uh, there's a, a great deal of uh, movement of people back and forth between Sulu and uh, and and Saba, and uh, so he he may have had relatives there uh, who may have helped him, but I don't know the uh, any specifics about that. And since we are on the topic of piracy already, um, mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts of the presentation, um, an anonymous attendee. 
um, is referencing the female pirate in the photo that you highlighted. And they would like to know, was there any document pertaining to her identity as well as her role or rank in the piracy group that may be beyond the scope of your knowledge, but it can't hurt to ask. Unfortunately, there was not any uh, any identifying information, and I um, this was a, this was part of a report that uh, uh, that Sultan Adil shared with me, and um, and I copied it, and um, and uh, un unfortunately, I didn't look at it carefully enough to notice the woman in the picture until uh, Sultan Adil had had already passed away, and I'm I'm very regretful that I wasn't able to ask him about. Uh, uh, about the woman in the picture, and um, so I don't, I don't know any uh, details about. It. Yes, it, it is hard to recover uh, details like that um, after certain time periods. Uh, a few more questions from anonymous attendees. Um, one person says, "Do you have any plans to write about Camelon?" I am now reading Moro Warrior, but I think Camelon's rebellion is more compelling. <laughs> uh, well, I um, I like them both, uh, but I uh, thank you very much um, uh, for your uh, thoughts on on that. Yes, I am uh, writing about Camelon uh, right now in this in, a, in this uh, forthcoming book called um, uh, uh, called Man of Mindanao. It will include the the story of the of Kamloon and the campaign against him, and uh, and uh, Lieutenant Adil's uh, participation in that campaign. Man of Mindanao is a book about Muhammad Adil uh, taking him from the end of the war uh, to his um, uh, to the end of the century, and um, it will include uh, a, a, a quite a number of, uh, of interesting uh, uh, adventures, uh, and it all, will also include. Uh, very prominently, uh, how it happened that he went from being a, a national hero of the Philippine Republic to a brigadier general in the Moro National Liberation Front. That sounds wonderful. Um, this is a very interesting question to me. It's when we think of the context that the Hook Rebellion was going on simultaneously, um, this question is asking, given his Moro roots, why is Camelon's rebellion mostly forgotten? Even by most other Moro armed groups. Well, I, I um, that's a good question that I've asked myself uh, numerous times. I think um, part of the reason is that uh, in the um, it was be I think partly it was because Moros. Philippine Muslims were largely forgotten in the first decades of the New Republic. Uh, they, very little attention was paid to them by, um, by the uh, government officials of the New Republic. Very little attention was paid to them by newspapers unless they did things like Tom Loon did. Now, there are various reasons for that, and there are various understandable reasons. Uh, the Morris had played a very prominent role. Uh, had gotten a, 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 actually uh, more than their share of attention under American colonialism, even under the Commonwealth. Uh, but when the Philippine Republic started, Moros were, um, for uh, let's say for almost 15 years, were um, uh, pretty much ignored by the government. And uh, and I think that that the the, uh, the fact that Kamlun, um, you know, even though he drew such a you know. Uh, a, so many resources from the government and his, his rebellion lasted so long, it was still relatively small compared to the Huck Rebellion. The Huck Rebellion was right next door to Manila. The Huck Rebellion had the, the, uh, the specter of communism uh, attached to it. Uh, Kamloons did not. And I think that all of that, so Huck Rebellion got a tremendous amount of attention and Kamloons Rebellion uh, got relatively little at the time and then was quickly forgotten. Which is why, honestly, Tom, I, I feel that these lectures and how um, through Roderick Hall, the Roderick Hall collection, we're trying to uncover these hidden legacies. Um, it really shows the significance of the work that you're doing and how we're able to spread uh, this kind of awareness. We're very grateful for that. Um, I'm very happy to be here. We have a question from Frank Lopez, who's also been contributing a lot to the chat. Thank you so much for that. Uh, before I ask his question, he actually has a note that you might find interesting. He says, a female pirate um, is mentioned by 
gosh, I hope I get this right. Schaffner, Schaffner USMC diary escape from the Davao penal colony. It may not be the same woman, of course, but it's just, you get the impression that there weren't that many female pirates. At well, thank time. you very much for that. That is a great tidbit. Uh, really a great it's story. A and, uh, um, I'll be sure to send you the chat box later so you can read through the comments. It really is um, a great conversation that's going on over there. Um, but Frank's actual question in the Q&A box is, um, are there any notes referring to Commodore Ramon A. Alcaraz? Uh, yes, he was. Um, I'm not sure it's the same person. Oh, I, I I don't know what um, the question was referring to. There was. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the person who was leading the Nanita unit um, um, at the time that they were uh, ambushed. Uh, who was heading up the Nanita unit at the time? That the na that name sounds familiar, but I I'm sorry, I don't um, I, I can't uh, speak. Uh, Specifically about that, if the name is, uh, I don't know that name. We understand. It's a, it's a, it's a big history. Yeah. Um, Jesus Terry Adivoso asks, uh, what exactly was Colonel Lansdale's role in Mindanao? I know he was concentrating on issues affecting the Philippines, mainly in Manila and Luzon, and even then was getting involved in Vietnam. So if you have, I guess, any more details on how he contributed to, um, forgot the phrase, uh, to the strategy against Kamlon. Yeah, just a few more details. He, um, again, he was advising uh, McSaisai, um, uh, particularly uh, when he was defense secretary. And so in those early years, 51, 52, uh, he was clearly very active in, um, in advising McSaisai in all of his military decisions, in including uh, the the uh, early uh, efforts against uh, early efforts against Kamloon. So he was clearly involved in the decision to send the Nanita unit there. And uh, as I mentioned, he was involved in um, he approved the use of American napalm against um, Kamloon. I don't I have any uh, information that it was ever actually used, but it, the, the use was approved. Then I think it was 1954 uh, that he uh, left left the Philippines and went to Vietnam. And did not uh, uh, did not return to to uh, the Philippines for a number of years. So he was out of the picture uh, by I think 1954. So he wasn't there for the final uh, campaign, uh, the 1954-55 campaign against Kamloon. The campaigns really are extraordinary. The way they were uh, escalating, it, it. I mean, in yes. my head, your presentation truly plays like a Hollywood action war film. Uh, so. It's just, it, it is very, very compelling. Um, Adrian asks, is Kamlon regarded as a hero within certain segments of the Sulu Sultanate and mainland Mindanao due to his resistance efforts against the Philippine government during the mid 20th century? So I guess his, his standing and legacy within yeah. the region. Yeah, I think I think that's similar to the question I was, we, I, was uh, talking about before in that I don't uh, I don't think that I don't know for certain but I don't if we're talking about this the Sulu Sultanate in the early 1950s and uh, leading uh, Moro figures uh, political figures in in elsewhere in the early 1950s I don't think they uh, thought of Kamloon as a hero I thought I think Kamloon uh, because he was he was rebelling against the Philippine Republic that they had uh, they were uh, invested in uh, uh, at the moment. They were trying to fit into this new republic, trying to figure out how they would fit in, and uh, they they were not interested in rebelling against the republic uh, at the moment. And um, and so they would not have considered him a hero. They would have considered him a uh, an outlier, an outlaw, a rebel. Uh, Kamloon was uh, a man of the people, and uh, his his support came from. Um, uh, came from uh, ordinary people, not from uh, uh, high-level politicians or uh, uh, sultans, yeah. Um, I, I would just like to mention a note uh, from Earl Fronda, who put this in the chat. Uh, he's, he points out, because we were wondering about the leader of the Nanita unit earlier, he says, Nap oh. my gosh, I hope I'm saying this correctly, 
Napoleon, Napoleon, uh, yeah. Valeriano yeah. was, if I remember correctly, the CEO of the Nanita unit, but I'm not sure if he was on Holo at that time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Valeriano, uh, Napoleon Valeriano is a very interesting man. He was very close uh, friend, drinking buddy, confidant of Edward Lansdale and actually um, followed Edward, went with Edward Lansdale to Vietnam and then was actually involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, wow. in Cuba in, in uh, 1960, whenever that was. Uh, so he's a very, very interesting uh, character of the period. And he was the founder and led the Nanita unit for those early years in uh, uh, in Central Luzon, by the he got a promotion though, and he went on uh, to um, command a, 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 a larger unit. And I think the the leadership of the Nanita unit, I think, went to an officer named Alcantara, and uh, I think he was the officer leading the Nanita unit or commanding the Nanita unit when they went to Holo. Uh, I'd have to double check that. Though. All right, uh, we have. Another question from Rasmia, who says, thank you very much for the lecture, sir. As a Moro, I am quite confused with the use of the term pirate. Um, with the piracy mentioned earlier as a common practice in Southeast Asia, similar, be similar to the quote, piratical unquote acts of the 1950s. Um, you see, it is difficult, it is just difficult to equate or see Ma'as Kamlon, who is like a hero to us in Sulu, likened to the term pirates or piracy? Well, that's a very, very good question and an important question. And um, let me let me address it in sort of a, a more general term, something I've been thinking about. Um, let's, yeah, the term pirate is a, is a problematic term in certain circumstances, right? But in other cir circumstances, it doesn't seem to be. So my question back to the audience is, why is it that some pirates are considered to be just fine and other pirates are considered to be very different? So why is it that European pirates, for example, are always get the always get the uh, the Hollywood treatment, right? Why is it so the Vikings? The Vikings were pirates, right? Yeah. There have been countless films, right, talking about the Vikings. Oh, they're adventurers, they're explorers, they're this and that. They were pirates. They did, they plundered and raped and stole people just like any other pirates. Uh, but you can go to Scandinavia today, and there are ton there are multiple museums focused on pirates. The Vikings have gotten this great, you know, gotten this really uh, um, easy, right, uh, reputation, uh, even though they were pirates. And then let's look at the pirates of the Caribbean, right? Uh, they get the Disney treatment, right? Uh, you know, so it, and you know, in the United States, there are children's parties, right, with pirate themes. That they're, they're the pirates are considered rapscallions and rogues, and but in fact, they were pirates. They 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 robbed and they plundered and they uh, and they stole people away and and so forth. So my only take is, you know, piracy. I think is a problematic term, but I. I don't have a problem using it, but I just think that every all pirates should be created equal and uh, and be and be uh, talked about in the same way. And I don't think it's fair that uh, European pirates get the get the Hollywood treatment and uh, Sulu pirates or Barbary pirates from uh, from from uh, Morocco uh, are are called you know, you know, uh, savages and and villains and and horrible people, and the Vikings get a get a free pass. So that's my that's my rant for the day. But your your question is is very good, and I uh, I take your point that um, uh, that uh, associating Kamloon with piracy uh, I, I I can see as a problem. Um, you we can call it by another name. We can call it C rating. But the fact is that he was uh, he was supported by uh, uh, by. Uh, uh, by pirates for uh, uh, by sea raiders for a period of time in the 1950s. In fact, Tom, um, the tail end of your answer neatly dovetails with a comment that just came in the chat from Francis Ed Villanueva, who says, I think the politically correct term for this tradition is raiding, uh, as they operated for human slave trade economy, which was quite common during the pre-Hispanic period and even well into the Spanish period of the Philippines. So. Um, even the, the, the term piracy now, it really has entered the public imagination, uh, precisely because of Hollywood portrayals 
uh, that you discussed. I think my reaction to when I first saw that component in your presentation was I can use that for marketing because I knew right away that it's a term that would that would grip the imagination, but it is deeply problematic and we greatly appreciate the nuanced answer to the question. Right, and I think that I think the problematic part of it again is that not all pirates are, are treated the same way, and uh, yeah, I think they should all, you know, and that and that's uh, so. Uh, I think that's unfortunate, and and I am perfectly fine with the term uh, sea raiders, although I, I I do think that they are um, they're they're synonyms. Yeah. Yes. Um... Frank Lopez adds, Manila Publications branded Camelon as the notorious bandit Camelon. So again, it, it emphasizes that uh, that depiction of him. And I'm dating- uh, Absolutely right. Absolutely right. There, he was always called a bandit uh, and an outlaw. Um, <laughs> and, and that was done all throughout the all throughout the American colonial period. Every time um, every time the the um, Americans were uh, fought uh, the Moros, uh, a Moro uprising. They were always termed as uh, uh, bandits and outlaws. It's a way to delegitimize um, uh, yeah, opposition. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so moving on to the next topic, um, Perlita asks, in your opinion, what led to Kamlan's continued resistance? What would account for the transformation of his causes? Uh, did these efforts come from below or were initiated from the top elites of the Moro community? I'm sorry, could you repeat just the first sentence? I missed that. I was looking at the uh, chat. Yeah. yeah uh, just the first I, sentence. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, what led to Kamlong's continued resistance? I think it's because you mentioned there were the three, or yeah. the third was the final, but the, uh, the surrenders. Um, what, was there more behind the story of not being well, given? Yes, and that's a, again, that's a, I think one of the reasons his his um, his uh, rebellion lasted so long is because he surrendered uh, uh, three times rather than once. The same thing with Geronimo. Uh, fighting an armed rebellion rebellion on a small island is very difficult, right? There are very few places to hide. Um, uh, Surrendering, surrendering uh, so that you can fight, um, surrendering with terms, which Kamlin always did, with concessions, so that he could fight another day is actually good strategy for a rebel, uh, for a rebel on a small island. And I think, um, I think that that his his um, his surrenders were very strategic. I think uh, local people understood that uh, that his surrenders were strategic. And I'll even add that even in his final surrender, the final time he surrendered, he had. Um, Part of the negotiation was that he would receive parole rather than uh, part of the concession was that he would receive parole rather than go to jail. And so he didn't uh, surrender with the intent of going to jail. He thought he would be paroled and would maybe be able to fight yet again. Um, but uh, it, and it, the case actually went to the Supreme Court. He sued uh, the Philippine government because they went back on their concessions and they were able to win the case by saying, he did not that the, that that the parole was based on certain conditions. He did not fulfill those conditions, so he had to stay in jail. So that that's another very interesting coda to the story, that even in his final surrender, um, he had negotiated uh, what he thought was an agreement that would keep him out of jail. Extraordinary! I, I would never have thought that he would sue the government. Um, again, it, it, it's yes. uh... <laughs> Amazing. So he, he may have been uneducated, but he was a very sophisticated um, uh, rebel in his way. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, did you ever have the chance to talk with his sons who joined the military about his exploits? With Kamala's sons, no, I, I have not. And, uh, I, uh, I, I, I would like to do that, have the opportunity to do that. Um, another question. This is a bit technical, and I'm I'm going to struggle with these names. Uh, the question is, oh my gosh, Captain Kalingalan Kaluang is a captain of the United States Armed Forces of the Far East, or the USAFFE, from Luxulu, and a relative of Apo Kamlon. Do you have any research about him? I do not. Um, I certainly know about the uh, uh, USAFE. The uh, United States uh, Armed Forces Far East. 
uh, which I talked about in my previous presentation. Um, uh, I, I think that's that's really interesting uh, information. I don't have any um, uh, I don't have any uh, uh, particular information about that. There are some um, uh, there are some good uh, uh, sources though to uh, to look for that. There's a um, uh, a book called uh, Among the Bravest, which is about Sulu uh, Sulu uh, guerrilla fighters in World War II. And then, um, hold on a second, I'll get the other book. I will be back shortly. Thank you. Very dedicated. And then this book, which some of you may know, uh, which is a book by uh, Guerrilla Days in the Philippine South by Cesar Pobre and, uh, and, uh, and Ricardo uh, Jose, uh, has a very good section on uh, the guerrilla, the World War II guerrilla movement in uh, in the Sulu, in Sulu, uh, including the Holo and Tawi Tawi, uh, that I would uh, uh, recommend uh, reading to see if you can uh, uh, find that name. Tom, your timing is actually perfect because one of the questions in our chat asks, "Will there be a bibliography listed?" I'm certainly happy to do that. Yes. Thank you for for providing one, but I can also say that FHL has compiled together a book list uh, from the Roderick Hall collection uh, with related topics to Tam Lawn's Rebellion. So you can learn more about that. And we will show the QR code for that book list uh, at the end of the talk. So please visit us here in the library and learn more from our resources. Okay. Um, the book that was just mentioned, in fact, I was told by our head librarian, is available at the FHL Rod Hall collection. So if it's not included in the book list that I just mentioned, we'll be sure to put it there. Thank you, Cecil, for letting me know. And Tom, we still have quite a few questions. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so these are, so this question is interesting, possibly a little controversial, but an anonymous attendee uh, wants to know, uh, in what ways did Kamalon most influence Miswari? Oh, I, I, uh, that's a good question. I don't, I think he probably in the most general way, it, it seemed that, um, it seemed that, uh, I, uh, this is, a, this information is from, um, uh, Ms. Wari's official uh, biography. I can't remember the name of the uh, of the biographer, but the, in that biography, it said that Kam, uh, that that Ms. Wari did not know about Kam Loon until he was asked by a professor at UP to write a paper about him. And so we, then he did research and found out uh, found out more about him. So it's a little surprising that even you know that would have been in the, in the '60s that he didn't know more about Kam Loon. And I'm not sure that's actually the case, but. Um, but but you take the biographer at his word. So maybe uh, uh, Miss Wari just knew a little bit about him and then learned much more. And that it was that research that inspired him to um, uh, to try to free Kamlun from jail, which he was uh, he successfully did. Um, oh, what was the what was the rest of the question? Actually, I think I've. Oh, Miss Wari. Yeah. So uh, oh, so uh, then. I would say just in the most general sense, that, as I had mentioned earlier, that uh, Kamloon is an inspiration. It's a David and Goliath story. Uh, Kamloon is, a, uh, is an early rebel who is a link between the past and the present. Um, and um, I think inspired, uh, likely inspired Ms. Wari that way. Um, since we are speaking about Kamloon's later days, there is a question from uh, Arius Raposas who says, um, would you know how Kamlon spent his later days? Did your research, were you able to touch upon that? Uh, if you mean later days after uh, leaving uh, prison? That's uh, how I understood the question, I, yes. My, uh, my sense, is, I don't know for sure, uh, my sense is that he he really, that Miswari was not exaggerated. He really was dying and that he only had uh, a, a very short time to live he was able to get, to return to Holo, and he, uh, he he died in his home community in Holo, but I don't know how long he lived. I see. Uh, this is not a question, but it's a fascinating comment. It's a good comment. Um, an anonymous attendee says this lecture is very timely as we are currently celebrating Bangsang Moral History Month this March. 
So it really is, um, it's perfect. I've seen a number of comments where people are hoping that this Zoom will be available on YouTube. Um, and the answer is yes, all of FHL's lectures are available on YouTube. Uh, we upload a cleaner copy of the lecture, usually one to two weeks after the lecture itself. So you will be able to view this and hopefully you can also use it for as a teaching resource perhaps um, in the future. Um, all right, let me get back to our still lengthy question list. Um, this may have already been asked, but I will ask it anyway, in case there is a, a, a nuance that we can work on. An anonymous attendee is taking us back to World War II. And the question is, how did Camlon get along uh, with Fertig? If not Fertig, any other Americans that he came into contact with and what did he take from his guerrilla days uh, in order to lead the rebellion? So maybe in terms of strategy or in terms of even the weapons, because the Americans ironically left behind uh, weapons that the rebellion was able to use. That would be good to know. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer to either of those questions. My sense is that uh, Kamlon had relatively uh, little or uh, no contact with Americans uh, during the war. They were relatively, un until the very end of the war, until the American invasion of Polo, uh, there were relatively few Americans, unlike in Mindanao, where there were, where there were a significant number of Americans um, who were, who were um, uh, left, uh, uh, left in Mindanao after the, uh, after the American surrender who remained in Mindanao free after the American surrender, there are relatively few in Holo. And um, so I don't, um, uh, my sense is that he did not have a lot of, he had no direct contact with Fertig and uh, and, and I, I, I would be surprised if he had significant contact with uh, any Americans, uh, except at the end of the war. I see. Um, this is not from uh, the Q&A box, but I, I just listening to you, I recalled, um, because we're back in World War II, I recalled that incredible story from last year about the Battle of Tamparan, which was really just, um, for those who are not familiar, this is the Carabao, uh, the Carabao suicide bomb in essence. Um, is there a similar story uh, here in Kamlon's rebellion? Of course, there was the final, uh, the final stand and the noose that was tightening, but um, you could, could tell us more about that or are there any other like really remarkable conflicts that jump out at you from that time? Uh, well, it's a, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, the um, you know this was a this was a true guerrilla war fought in a, a fought in a jungle primarily, and um, the the Battle of Tamperan was unusual because it was a rare case of a mass atta mass attack uh, 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 against Japanese troops. Uh, that's that was rare. That's rare in all uh, guerrilla um, conflicts, uh, you know, uh, frontal attacks. Uh, but there but there were some really interesting um, uh, examples of uh, 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 very different types of attacks uh, in the in the Kamlun uh, in Kamlun's rebellion. Let me just tell you about one uh, that that uh, Sultan Adil told me. So in 19 early 1955, as part of the last campaign. Uh, the the Philippine military had set up various camps uh, in uh, in eastern Holo, again trying to uh, uh, pin Kamlun down, and uh, so Sultan Adil tells the story of one morning in one of those camps. Uh, it was pre-dawn, and the soldiers were gathering on the parade ground uh, for uh, for morning reveille, and and um, uh, a um, a man, one of uh, Camlin ordered, uh, uh, told one of his men to go to go there in uniform, uh, in the, in a Philippine Army uniform, carrying a um, an Army issued rifle. Uh, the man walked to the center of the uh, the center of the parade ground, knelt down, and began shooting, and uh, and shooting all around him. Uh, it was still uh, quite dark. Uh, the panicked soldiers. Uh, picked up their own guns and started shooting uh, from where they thought the, the firing was coming from. And of course, started hitting each other. When, uh, when, when finally the shooting had ended, um, they found 10 dead soldiers uh, on the ground. None of them 
uh, was Pam Loon's man who, man who had escaped. This was, a, this was a, a, an extraordinary uh, example of um, uh, psychological warfare, right? Tom Loon was trying to send a message to these soldiers that there was nowhere safe on Hola for them, no matter how, you know, how uh, well protected their camp was and how many of them there were, there was still gonna be nowhere safe for them on Holo. And it's a, quite a remarkable story. It, it really is um, because psychological warfare, we hear of it a lot being told usually from the other side. That's um, right. Yeah. I think you, well, you didn't use the term in the talk, but um, I was thinking the dirty tricks of um, the other side. So um, it's, it's an incredible story in that, um, in that sense. And this uh, was an example of psychological warfare I, that was uh, superior to the, uh, to the dirty tricks uh, used by, um, uh, by Edward Lansdale in, uh, in the Huck Rebellion. And some of you may know uh, about some of those, yeah. Yes. Um, so there is, this is a, the, actually a personal question, a bit of a light question before we go back to more serious topics. But um, our audience would like to know um, if you will be vis visiting the Philippines anytime, perhaps we could have an on-site talk here instead of a webinar. Oh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, I hope to be, um, uh, I hope to visit the Philippines uh, in uh, next fall in um, uh, September, October. Oh, September, October. Okay, we will, we will keep that in mind. Um, another question we have here is from my Sarah, who says, what was the legacy of Camlon in terms of the Moro's quest for self-determination? Was his rebellion the continued expression of the Moro's political resistance against colonizers? Well, I think it was, yes. I mean, that's a very good question. In other words, um, if we're talking about continuity, right, um, the, the most recent colonizer that had been, that that uh, that Kamloon had experienced were the Japanese occupiers, foreigners coming to occupy his island. And um, when those, when those uh, occupiers left and were replaced by other uh, outsiders, these are of course much more local outsiders, uh, an out, uh, government um, for various reasons we've I've talked about before, uh, he, he continued the fight, yes. Our next question is from um, Neville, I think the name is pronounced Neville, Opsar. Uh, this one may be a little bit tricky, but it says, in major rebellions, rebel groups often resort to coercion in pursuit of their demands. What specific grievances do these rebel groups typically have? And have there been instances where the Philippine government has responded positively to their requests? Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I, I'd rather speak specifically about Kamloon and, rather than uh, Philippine uh, rebel groups in general. Uh, clearly, um, uh, so I should say first that in terms of uh, coercion, uh, coercion used by uh, rebels, um, I have not heard of any examples of that uh, with Kamloon. Uh, the the um, the local population really did seem to support him. Now he did have um, uh, he did have conflicts uh, with other political leaders in uh, obviously in Holo and and even in Eastern Holo and. Uh, uh, there was, uh, and those those uh, sometimes turned violent. But in terms of support from uh, from uh, ordinary people, villagers, uh, that seemed to come very voluntarily and did not uh, require coercion on his part. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, uh, demands made by uh, uh, to the government, uh, well, you know, he. Uh, uh, what he was able to do was get was get concessions from the government when he surrendered. Yeah, and um, and it, I don't. Uh, Kamloon again. He was a uh, he was a very traditional sort of rebel. He did not have a list of you know a, a ten point list of demands. Uh, he wasn't trying to um, uh, do anything more than simply say, you know, leave me alone. In I want to live the way I, I used to live, and uh, I I don't want the 
this new government interfering in my uh, in my home territory. Uh, it, it it wasn't um, it it wasn't a, a very uh, a clearly articulated set of demands. Um, it was simply uh, go away, leave me alone. And in relation to that, we have an anonymous attendee who asks, um, was there any kill on site order for Kamlon or what was the policy surrounding him? Was it really just capture, surrender or something more than that? No, I think there probably was a kill on site order. I mean, they were um, they were not uh, pussyfooting around. Right. You know, the uh, the this was a this was a very bloody conflict you know and and if you think about the there are the artillery barrage uh that happened and um uh, uh and and the high body counts on both sides i i'm sure um uh i'm sure there was an order to kill kamloon on site the problem was they never saw him <laughs> yes it's hard to I kill mean, someone on site if you, if you never see him yeah. the, the elusiveness of um of kamloon right. and the stories you told he was always just always managing to get away. Exactly, yeah. um, this this reminds me of the part in the presentation. Oh no, wait. Um, it, it was one of the uh, one of the three engagements that I wanted to bring up, but I'm blanking out as well. I think I need to recharge with coffee. Um, while I try to remember that question, um, let me turn again to the chat box. This is a nice, um, a nice plea, uh, which is um, in relation to uh, you visiting um, Manila. There is a nice plea that says, "Please also visit Zamboanga City, if you can." Oh, so I'd I love to. I, I, I almost certainly will. Yes. Yeah. And a new question has just come in that says. Okay, this is a bit long. I, I will have to read it. Um, uh, good morning. Good morning, Ma'am Charlene and Sir Tom. Thank you for the presentation. Um, the question for Sir Tom is, based on your research, has Haji Kamlon any comments on the engagements of the fighting prowess of the nascent Philippine Marines at that time? And the person asking is um, CDR Mark Pondeno. He is a naval historian and senior shrine curator of the PEFTOK Korean War Memorial Hall Museum. Uh, I I don't uh, other than um, well I, I really don't um, you know this was um, this was a very challenging campaign for the Philippine military uh, 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 you know and. Uh, Let's take Lieutenant Adil, for example. He was, I mean, he, he's somewhat a neutral example because uh, Kamlun would never engage with him because he right. was a fellow Moro. Um, but he really tried to find Kamlun and, 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 uh, and he and, and Adil was very, very successful against Kamlun's uh, lieutenants. Uh, so, uh, but it was still a very, very difficult uh, 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 campaign. And I, I, I will give you the, you know, the, again, the example of the the Nanita unit. Uh, it's uh, it's it's an extreme example, but uh, a very telling one. That uh, this was a this was a uh, a unit that um, was uh, high, it's decorated and uh, and much feared unit, and they did not fare well on the island of Polo. That actually, I've always wondered about that. Um, why was the Nanita unit chosen as the first unit um, to try to subdue? Kamlon, because they were an extremely elite unit. Um, how did Kamlon, in other words, get on the government's radar that this is the unit? And that name, Tom, can you please tell us about that name? Nanita sounds like an endearment, like a it's it's a very, very romantic sounding name for oh. a unit that is basically hardcore, you know. Um, well, uh, the the story goes that Nanita was actually the name of uh, Colonel Valeriano's uh, former girlfriend, uh, or girlfriend at the time the unit formed. So he named it in her honor, and um, uh, that's that's the, the story I've uh, I've uh, heard, and I think it's a good one, and I also think it's accurate. And uh, the you know again, I think that uh, 
that uh, both Maxi Sai and Lansdale wanted a quick end to this uh, to this rebel, and so they, they they thought to themselves, "What's the best way to do that? We'll take the most successful, uh, most elite unit we have in our other rebellion, send them down there, and uh, make quick work of it." And it uh, obviously did turn out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, it it literally had the opposite effect because. Um, if Kamlon was hoping to stay under the radar, if you annihilate a unit like that, you are you're not going to stay under the radar. Yeah, that's true as well. Mm -hmm. The question that I blanked out earlier, um, I remember it now. I was very curious about um, the surrender that you described, the very first surrender where they had a photo op and um, Kamlon soldiers were actually, I think in your description, you said they were giving up rusty guns. I was wondering if there was um, any reason behind that because their, their weapons should have been more advanced given what was left behind by the Americans. Well, that, that's then you've answered the question. They, they, they didn't want to give up their good weapons. They, they only gave up the rusty, old, uh, decrepit weapons. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's not a dirty trick, uh, but it's a, a clever trick uh, that's, that's used by that's been used by other guerrilla groups, and and by uh, and particularly by um, by Moro fighters more than once. That um, you know, when when you're asked to surrender your guns, uh, you you don't give up your your best guns first. You give up the the ones you don't really want or need. And uh, I, I think in some sense, Kamlu knew that this was a uh, never going to be a real surrender, and uh, so he wasn't going to. Uh, give up anything until he got the concessions that he had negotiated for. And when those were not forthcoming immediately, he then went back to the hills. I see. Um, so really it was a symbolic surrender, but it does, it does give the sense that he didn't yeah. have much faith that um, the government would uphold their end of the bargain. And yes. I, yeah. I think that's, uh, I think he had a sense that uh, it was, yeah, it was not just a symbolic surrender. It was a, it was a staged. Um, I think farce is maybe too strong a word that the newspaper used, but it was a fake surrender on on both sides. I think uh, the government never intended to fulfill the concessions, and Kamloon never intended to actually surrender unless he got all the concessions he asked for. And even then, he may not have surrendered for long. That that's actually, there was a very astute observation earlier um, in the chat. I, I apologize that I can't remember the specific person, but I, I believe they pointed out, and you um, may agree or disagree, Tom, uh, they pointed out that the pattern of surrender, failing to meet concessions, restarting, um, that since it repeated itself, it may have become um, a kind of model for how, um, conflicts later on um, would happen. So it feels like there was that element of distrust um, that we could already see in these early in these early encounters would continue uh, throughout history. Well, whenever there are, are yeah, I, th I think that's fair. Uh, whenever there are negotiated surrenders and, and the surrenders are not, are conditional and, and are particularly when there are concessions to go along with them, uh, they're always going to be, um, uh, you know, they're always going to be um, incomplete surrenders until the concessions are made. And again, the other side of it is that, again, it's difficult to carry out a rebellion on an island. And so uh, surrendering um, for concessions, it, it can be part of a strategy to actually continue the rebellion. You're, you're surrendering, you're taking a break in order to be able to fight another day. Um, a question just uh, rapid just came in just now in response to, to what you just said um, from Thelma Padero, and she is asking, what in general were Camelon's conditions or concessions for him to surrender? I, I do remember in the talk you mentioned um, a, a payment uh, as well as uh, a pilgrimage trip for Camelon and some of his um, compatriots. But did these concessions remain the same or were there other concessions that came in? Well, I think, you know, the, so the concessions that generally would be, you know, uh, monetary payments uh, for, for various things, monetary payments to his followers, um, uh, 
the uh, ability to stay out of jail would be a very, very important concession. And uh, and I think at one point, Kamala was all, what part of the concession was that uh, criminal cases that were pending against him for uh, for murder and other cases uh, that they be dropped, uh, and so uh, um, uh, so we wouldn't have to uh, be tried for those as well. So. Tom, please don't kill me, but I'm going to bring up the topic of piracy for one last time because a question has come in and it is um, it is interesting in its economic aspect. So an anonymous attendee asks, would you say that piracy or C rating was mainly how Camlon financed the rebellion? You know, I don't know. Um... The answer to that, uh, it was um, Muhammad Adil's um, uh, uh, very informed opinion that that it was a significant uh, part of financing the rebellion. It makes sense because it, the the uh, uh, piracy was uh, you know was a, uh, a could be very lucrative. But also uh, you know this was also the time of. Uh, what what is called smuggling, which is also a problematic term, but barter trade, kind of uh, um, undocumented uh, trading uh, in uh, in the Sulu Sea uh, and uh, Celebi Sea, and uh, that that could have also been uh, uh, partly uh, financed his uh, rebellion as well. Um, we are actually running out of time, so we will end the Q and A portion with um with a comment and one question and i'm very pleased to say that our comment is from i'm very certain this is marie marie vallejo who gave a wonderful talk on dauntless um back in january for fhl thank you marie for joining us this morning um and her comment is this alejandro suarez was the recognized guerrilla leader of polo and sulu he reported to fertig on mindanao and suarez is the person who would have dealt with Camelon's activities, so. Um, oh, yeah, and that, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad she brought that up because uh, Alejandro Suarez was a very, very interesting man. He was actually Maguindanaoan by birth. Uh, and he had, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was adopted by, uh, uh, by uh, Spanish uh, parents. And um, uh, he spoke fluent Maguindanaoan. He was, uh, he was a, a, someone who could, uh, Communicate uh, beautifully between uh, also uh, between uh, Moros and and, uh, and non Moros, and he was also a very very um, uh, very skilled uh, military leader. Uh, he was he was actually in the in the American military, the USAFE, but before uh, the war, and then became a, a guerrilla leader. And he was in charge of all the guerrillas on uh, uh, in Sulu, and I'm sure that uh, Kamloon uh, uh, knew him, at least knew of him, and probably almost certainly had met him. Thank you, Tom. So our final question is um, a little bit beyond the scope of the talk, um, but it is about Lieutenant Adil. So this, this would be, um, it's a little bit tricky, but this would be interesting for you. And it has to do with, um, Adil's very complicated relationship, both with the government and also the MNLF. Um, and the question is, uh, was Lieutenant Adil still active in the military um, when he joined the MNLF? And perhaps what were uh, the reasons for his revolt? Uh, no, he was not active in the military when he joined the MNLF. Uh, he certainly still had many, uh, many friends and former comrades in the military, and it was a very, very difficult uh, decision for him. Um, and the reason uh, that he was not in the military, he might have reached, been had reached retirement age by then, but the reason he wasn't in the military earlier is that um, Ferdinand Marcos had actually uh, 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 taken away his commission uh, for for uh, political reasons, and uh, and that sort of started the ball rolling uh, in terms of uh, uh, of uh, was then Lieutenant Colonel Adil uh, trying to understand what his place was going to be in uh, uh, now in in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the military and the republic. He spent a great many years 
uh, trying to have it, get his commission back and he eventually did after uh, Marcos left office. And I think that will be, uh, that story will be continued in your book. Um, it will. That will be coming out hopefully next year. And uh, there have been many questions actually in the chat about when your book will be coming out. Yeah. So uh, for those people who are asking, Tom is hoping to uh, that it will be finished and it will be ready by- I'm writing as fast as I can. <laughs> we appreciate it. And we hope that you'll be able to launch the book with us as well. Um, and perhaps do a Philippine tour. So it has to be Manila, uh, Zamboanga City, Sulu. You have to visit everybody at this point. Uh, because the audience I'm looking forward to that very much. Thank you, Tom. This brings us to the end of our Q&A. And you have now survived uh, another somewhat grueling session from our, um, our astute audience. Um, so thank you for the discussion. And of course, thank you to your thank you to the audience for your participation as well. Uh, the Q and A's are very, very rich for that. And a thank big shout out for all those uh, very wonderful questions. Yes, they really are. I, I, um, sometimes I'm, I, I get a little worried, but uh, the audience always comes through. Um, but before I end this section, I'd like to give a big shout out to um, our member from the Mindanao Development Authority, who also participated quite a bit uh, in the chat and in the, the Q&A ask box. We really appreciate all of your contributions today. Um, Tom, any final words? <laughs> no, I just, uh, uh, just to thank everyone again uh, for the very thoughtful questions and, uh, and informative questions. And uh, to say that I, I look forward to, um, uh, to coming back to talk to you some more about, uh, about Sultan Adil. And, uh, and I, I'm uh, working hard on the book so that it, it will be out uh, by early next year. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to everyone else for joining us. And this is the book list that I mentioned earlier uh, that we have prepared. Uh, if you would like to learn more about Camelon's Rebellion, and other related, um, other related topics. So the book list is bit.ly bit bit dot backslash FHL dash morrows. And of course, if you want to access a broader book list from the Roderick Hall archive, we also have the QR code and bit.ly code for that um, at the bottom of the page. If you enjoy today's free talk, Please follow FHL's social media pages for updates, as well as the Ayala Foundation and the Ayala Museum. You can find us on Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube. The Ayala Museum and Filipinas Heritage Library are open to visitors and researchers. To book a visit or to learn about our upcoming programs, go to ayalamuseum.org and filipinaslibrary.org.ph. Again, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. As always, please stay safe and stay healthy. We hope to see you on March 23rd for the conclusion of the second Roderick Hall Memorial Lectures. Rod described himself as a man with a mission and a man in a hurry. His mission was to collect as many materials on the experiences of Filipinos during World War II and to place them in a library that would ensure that these are shared with today's generation as well as those in the future. And he found this repository as well as partners with us in the Filipinas Heritage Library. So in 2010, Rod shipped his entire collection, lock, stock, and barrel of 700 volumes from his home in London to FHL in Makati. Through the years, his collection has grown to more than 2,000 print and non-print materials on World War II making the Roderick Hall Collection FHL's crown jewel. As such, 
It is FHL centerpiece, literally and figuratively, because we now revolve our collection focus around the period immediately before, during, and right after World War II, identified as the formative period of Philippine nation. to collect books and various other historical materials relating to the Philippines during that war and to make this more accessible to the general public. He turned this collection over to the Filipinas Heritage Library, where it now forms a major part of its holdings as the Roderick Hall Collection. But Rod was not one to simply donate books. He wanted other people to use them and to research more on the war. He wanted to add more materials and was constantly in search of new directions for the collection. To this end, he was able to negotiate digitization of numerous manuscripts in various collections around the Philippines. He wanted to provide as many different perspectives as possible. And when he learned of the large body of works in Japanese, aimed to acquire as much as possible for the collection. Why are you collecting? Japanese publications about the Battle of the Philippines, even though you do not understand Japanese language. You said to me, I always answer the, this question like that. I want next future generation to know what happened in Philippines during the Asia Pacific War and the Philippines under Japanese rule. However, you told me the real reason is that collecting Japanese books is to make peace of my mind and making requiem for my deceased family. As a post-war Japanese generation, I promise you to try to make no more war society and also to try not to create the kind of people such as you and your family horribly experienced in Philippines. I think the Japanese should know the facts of this history. I believe this is my mission as a Japanese. Current thinking on the previous century and its many upheavals and wars is that we all have an ethical obligation to remember that history. But understandably, not everyone takes up that burden because the memory of war, especially for persons who witnessed it, is painful. The late Mr. Rod Hall was deeply courageous in that sense of taking up an ethical burden. He took pains to give World War II its proper mourning, not just for himself, but also for our country, America and Japan, whose materials he collected. He helped strengthen our cultural memory in the hope of preventing the return of suffering. And now with his passing, we in turn at Filipinas Heritage Library and Ayala Foundation have an obligation to make his legacy and his commemoration of history endure.